In this video, I want to do something very different. Instead of reviewing an ink, I want to show how I test for ink's viscosity, how I process the data, and then how I build the display that I use in the bell curve that appears on this channel. First off, what is viscosity? Viscosity is a material's resistance to flow. Now, this is largely influenced by the shape of the particles, but I have no way to test that and get those results, so I sort of move past it. This, this resistance to flow, which is how it's frequently referred to in fountain pens, something that has a very low viscosity tends to be considered very wet, and a fluid that has a very high viscosity will be considered very slow or dry because it's resisting flow. So how do I measure viscosity? Well, first I looked into ways that you could measure it and devices that could do it very accurately. Now, if you have a spare $3,500 laying around, you can get a thermo viscometer, which frankly is out of my budget. I don't have that kind of resource to just throw at something for my own mild amusement. So I couldn't really use that, but I'll put a picture of one up somewhere along the line here so that we can see it. Quite a bit less at $750 is a consistometer. Now again, well outside my budget and it would take quite a bit of ink for me to be able to test this, putting it outside what I can use. A third more practical way to test viscosity is a viscosity cup. Now painters use this frequently to make sure that the paint can go through the spray gun without a problem. But this requires quite a bit of ink, which would make every single time I tested a viscosity need a couple of bottles. Again, putting it outside what I can afford to do for this type of testing. Now, while all three of these methods will work, they're outside of my budget, so it's not something that I'm really looking at. Which leads me to what I chose. I use a tilt test. I measure the time it takes water to travel a designated distance. Now the distance inside the black lines is 18 inches. The distance I chose didn't matter as long as the distance you use is consistent. I just needed something far enough that I could easily tell differences in different runs of the ink or water as it went down. The largest factor that does affect viscosity is temperature. So to gain control of the problem with temperature, what you do is you run the test with water right before you run it with ink so that everything is the same temperature. I place a single drop of ink because the water doesn't show up well on camera. I let that drop of ink run down and time it on this stopwatch. Now, I do this nine times, and I average those nine times. I take the nine times of the ink run that have been averaged and divide that by the average run for water. This is gonna give me a viscosity factor for that individual ink. Now that we have our data points, we need to process them. And this ultimately is the beginning of everything that became my channel. I was really interested in the difference between a wet ink and a dry ink. So I tested over a thousand inks for viscosity to really try and understand those differences that people were talking about. That was all done of over a thousand inks before I ever filmed my first video. So what is a standard deviation? It quantifies a data set, so it's easier to distinguish between different numbers in a very diverse size sample. Now, when it comes to a standard deviation, you have very specific calculations that you have to do. I'm gonna have to zoom in so that we can see it a little bit easier, and yes, I have a whiteboard in my house. Don't judge me, I'm a nerd. Let's say you had four data points. From these data points, we're just gonna use the numbers one, two, three, and four. Now, the first thing you wanna be able to do with these four data points is you want to average them. And the average of these four data points are 2.5. Now, with that average, what I wanna be able to do is I wanna be able to take the actual data number, subtract the average from it, so we're gonna go slower so that we can see everything. When I subtract the average, I get the one minus 2.5, which is a negative 1.5, two minus 2.5, which is a negative 0 0.5, three minus 2.5, which is a positive 
2.5 and 4 minus 2.5 for a plain old positive 1.5. Now these numbers are gonna be what begins to help us. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that last number, which is made by the number minus the average, and I'm gonna square it. That's gonna give me 2.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and 2.25. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna average all of those. And when I average all of those, what I'm gonna get is 2.5. Now that I have all of those averaged, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the square root of that number. The square root of that number is approximately 1.58. We're gonna go ahead and give it the Greek letter sigma, just because we're nerdy. And this number right here is the standard deviation. This helps. I know what some people might be saying, but aren't some samples bad? Aren't some data points unreliable? Yes, some data points are bad. These bad data points are called outliers, and this is where tons of the math gets exciting because I know everybody is still here. Hold on, because it gets even better. An outlier can be excluded from my data set so that it doesn't skew the results that we have, although I don't throw that piece of data out entirely. So how do you know if you have an outlier? Easy. Let's say you had an exciting data set like this one. 25, 30, 35, 35, 35, 40, 40, 40, 45, 45, 50, 60, and 150. What do you do with this? Well, one of the things you need to know is, is something way outside of normal? And one way to look at it is simply a dot plot, where you line up each of the numbers with a little X above it. So a 25, 30, 35, 35, 35, 40, 40, 40, 45, 45, 50, 60, and then way off on the right, 150. And I just skipped filling in all of those spots. But that point, way off on the right, gives us a real hint about what's going on. Why am I looking at the mic? Now this isn't very exciting to look at, but what we do see when this happens is we do notice that there's this point way off over here, all on its own, and it does mean that what we need to do is to test some of what we have. So let's get this very exciting dot plot out of the way. This is our median. So we get to throw a few little math words in there because I'm kind of a math nerd. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find the middle of the right half and the middle of the right half comes between 45 and 50, which puts the third quartile at 47.5. That's an important number for me. And it's gonna put the first quartile right between 35 and 35, giving us a 35 first quartile. If I want to find an outlier, what I need to know is the inner quartile range. And to do that, it's really simple. I take the third quartile and subtract the first, or easily 47.5 minus 35, and that's going to give me a nice 12.5. This is an important number. An outlier is anything more then 12.5 away this way from 47.5. So past 60, that becomes an outlier and it's a data point that I can remove from my set before I was to go put it into the uh, standard deviation. Similarly, a number can be too small. If I subtract 12 and a half from 35, Wow, I wind up with 22.5. Anything smaller than 22.5 or larger than 60 is an invalid number based on this data set. So I would exclude it. 
Now this is the bell curve that I use in my videos and right in the middle, we see average. Now the thing about average is there's average and there's normal. From average, one standard deviation to the right and one standard deviation to the left. This whole range right here is normal. But how big is normal? Thirty-four percent to the right and to the left, so above and below the average, is all normal. This makes a whole 68% of all the inks we see are bound to fall in that range because they're normal. Now, as they move farther towards dry, we get the next 13.5%, which occupies both sides of the graph there. 2.35% and then at the very end, 0.15%. Now again, that 2.35 is over here and that 0.15. The thing is, this is what matters. This is where normal is and it starts to tell us dry and wet. I am really distracted because the microphone is right there and I keep looking up at it. It's the bell curve that allows you to take the data point of that one ink being tested and show it in relation to all others that have been tested. So if one shows up as normal, but the high side of normal, we can see it right here without any kind of real problem, but we get to see where it falls in the spectrum of over a thousand ink viscosities tested. So that's all there is to it. Easy. And all of this becomes about 20 seconds of video. Until tomorrow, thanks for watching.